Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetRootsRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It is Tuesday, April 25th, 2017. Let's move the microphone a little bit closer here. How did we do on the levels yesterday? I think our levels, as between me and Greg, were a little bit better yesterday. I repositioned the microphone, and I'm going to try and do it. A little work on that again here today. I sort of boosted it up a little bit and a little closer, and I think that was all it really took. We only have crude controls here at k in the Morning World Headquarters. Uh, Flint and steel and a hamster to run the place and then we can position the microphone a little differently and get our levels a little bit better of course greg's not here today for us to compare levels you'll have to go back and listen to yesterday's show if you want to do that or take my word for it even though there's so much fake news around you can hardly even tell what's real anymore let's see uh is uh, i don't know everybody's retweeting trump all of a sudden he must be in the middle of a tweet storm this morning i think he is Tweeting about well, let's see. He's uh, I see people tweeting about him tweeting about Canada. Uh, is he angry with Canada? Something about the border wall. Okay, so all, all this morning, uh, I guess he's been up for and tweeting for about an hour. Let's see. This morning, he's proud of Ivanka for something, and she's in Germany, and she's getting booed wildly apparently and hissed as she tells the the W twenty. That's the gathering of women leaders from among the G20, the G20 nations. Uh, what was that? The 20 largest economies in the world? I can't even remember what some of these organizations are anymore. Uh, we used to not worry so much when our nation sent representatives to the G20. We didn't even bother to figure out what the G20 was because uh, it was in good hands. Even if it was in Republican hands, it was in relatively decent hands. Now, of course, it's in tiny hands. And... Uh, the guy wants to light everything on fire, so that's a problem. He's also, yes, tweeting about Canada. Let's see. Ah, uh, yes, he's angry about the dairy issues as between the two countries. We might as well have a war at this point, <clears throat> really. Um, uh, 54-4% or fight, I guess. We can fight about the dairy issues. Uh, let's see. Oh, and uh, he, he says this morning, don't let the fake media tell you. That I have changed my position on the wall, and that's in all caps. It will get built and help stop drugs, human trafficking, etc. And just in time to stop the human trafficking, too, as I uh, thought I would remind you yesterday, but there was so much other garbage to get to. I didn't get to it. Raw Story had this news over the weekend. Don't let uh, the fake news media tell you that he's not stopping human trafficking. He has a he has a handle on the human trafficking. Former Trump Kentucky campaign chair charged with human sex trafficking of a minor. Just thought I'd bring you up to date on that story. I'd read you the story, but there's a pinwheel of death spinning. So uh, I can't do it. I'll stay in the pocket view of this thing over at Ross. Hey, it's a Bob Brigham story, everybody. Bob Brigham on this one for Ross. I had no idea he was writing for Raw story. Uh, this is, this is the news. A former judge now serving as a school board member. Yay. Perfect. In suburban Cincinnati has been charged with felony human trafficking of a minor. Also, of course, felony inducing a minor to engage in sex and a third count of giving alcohol to a minor. The indictment was obtained by River City News publisher Michael Monks, who described, t- uh, former judge Tim Nolan, as an outspoken and controversial political figure. He is controversial, and that's very controversial human sex trafficking. Everybody, people aren't sure how they feel about it. It's contentious. Uh, Both sides do it. You know how it is. Judge Tim Nolan of California, Kentucky, and that's the reason, really. Everyone knows those are California values. California, Kentucky, anyway. Uh, He represents District 5 on the Campbell County School Board. Yesterday afternoon, this would have been... uh, Let's see, that would have been Friday afternoon. He was led into court wearing handcuffs as the perp walk was filmed by the local CBS station. That must have been fun. News anchor Cammie Dirking of WKRC. KRC, that's not WKRP, though that would be funny. WKRC described Judge Nolan 
as an outspoken supporter of the Tea Party. What do you know? Who would have guessed? The sex trafficking allegedly occurred in August of 2016, way back when Judge Nolan was serving as chair of the Donald Trump campaign in Campbell County. Trump, by the way, beat Hillary Clinton 59-35 in that county, so good job. In between the uh, sex trafficking, you managed to do an excellent job for your guy in the campaign, <clears throat> and I'm sure he rewarded you appropriately. Voters also elected Nolan, of course, to the school board at that time. In April of 2016, Nolan unsuccessfully attempted to remove Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell as a delegate to the RNC convention. So he's not all bad, right? He's got some redeeming qualities. I don't know. What do you say about a guy like this? Between fighting Senator McConnell in April and uh, trafficking in uh, minors for the purpose of sex, I guess, the alleged crimes in August, Nolan was appointed by Governor Matt Bevin to the Kentucky Boxing and Wrestling Commission. He was going to wrestle this girl, I guess, but was removed only days later when a scandal erupted over. Can you imagine what what scandalizes a child rapist and sex trafficker? Alleged. Sorry. What would uh, what do you think? Well, the scandal erupted over a Ku Klux Klan photo posted to Nolan's Facebook now, unlike Republican Governor Bevin, the Trump campaign chose not to drop Judge Nolan after the KKK scandal. There's a linked story here. I, I want to take a look at that one. Well, you know, opinions differ. Some people say the KKK were good guys. Others say they weren't. Besides which, Robert Byrd, 100 million years ago, something, something. I don't know. Uh, trying to read the story, but uh, Cincinnati.com wants to have six or seven pop-ups here instead. Let's see. Former judge in Campbell County says he's not the man in a Ku Klux Klan outfit. In a photo posted it on the website, and Friday sued the managers of the site for defamation. Tim Nolan, what? And this is interesting. I it doesn't even really does it matter if you're not the guy in the picture, but if you put it on your Facebook. But it, and now this this article says it was posted to a website. I'm a little curious. <clears throat> Let's read on with the side note here. Sidebar on this guy's clan ties. Tim Nolan of California in southern Campbell County said in the suit, the photo has damaged his political career. Dang. And his hopes of starting a new career as a boxing and mixed martial arts promoter. By the way, I mean, I guess anybody can be a promoter. But, uh, well, you know, I wouldn't have picked that out for him. He doesn't look like a practitioner, let's say. But, okay, he wanted to make money off of other people's beating the crap out of each other. Interesting. So he ends up on the commission and because he wants to start a new career as a promoter. I, I don't know. Is, is that the way it's supposed to work? Aren't you? I don't know. It seems like there should be some separation there. But uh, leave it to the Republican governor to say, oh, he wants to make money from that? We should let him regulate it. All right. Anyway, Nolan, a district judge in the 1970s and 80s, filed suit in Campbell County Circuit Court against former Campbell County School Board member Mike Combs and others he claimed operate GOPFacts.org. Nolan, who is Donald Trump's campaign manager in Campbell County, has been a Tea Party loyalist for many years, often criticizing local Republican leadership. Tea Party really hasn't been allowed long enough to be a, a, um, a loyalist Two, but okay. I mean, you know, I guess <clears throat> if you're loyal for a week or so, I guess that will work. GOPFacts.org claimed Nolan is the man in the Klan outfit in a Campbell County bar called the Rabbit Hole. Ooh. Uh, Nolan posted the picture with the statement, uh, he meant to say Combs, but he wrote Coleman, C O M N. Sick. Uh, out. To, oh, oh, I see. Come like it's come as in come out. Come out to the rabbit hole and join the clan, which is spelled with a C here, by the way. Nolan quickly deleted the post, but was caught by others who saved it. Ah, OK, now it's becoming clear. So on his Facebook page, I guess he posted a picture of someone in a clan outfit at the rabbit hole. And then he deleted it because he said, oh, my God, that's ridiculous. I'm going to get myself arrested or worse, uh, but somebody captured it. GOPFacts.org captured it, and now he's mad. <clears throat> if it wasn't Nolan in the Klan robes, Nolan said, it was a friend. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Why does it? I thought it said if it wasn't. It says it wasn't, or he claims it wasn't. He says it was a friend of his posing as a joke 
Yeah. As a, at a Halloween party in 2013, according to Nolan's lawyer, Christian Dennery, the guy in the robes who Dennery didn't name, has two black grandchildren. Dennery said some of his best grandchildren are black, so he can't possibly be a real Klansman because nobody with a racist history in the South ever turns out to have black children or grandchildren, as you know. Right, Strom? It's impossible. The peculiar institution grows more peculiar every day. Okay. Well, how strange. Anyway, it wasn't me. It was my friend. That's no better. Oh, it was my friend on Halloween. I see. Are you sure he has black grandchildren? Maybe that was a Halloween costume. I don't know. Anyway, it's a joke in the neighborhood because every year he dresses up as a Klansman and he has two black grandchildren that he loves to death. Dennery said, that is a huge joke. That neighborhood is hilarious. Oh, my God. Every year, this guy dresses up as a Klansman. As a joke. Just wondering. <clears throat> okay. That's that's a hell of a joke. Those guys are funny. Don't let anybody tell you Mallard Fillmore isn't hilarious. Or this. That's, wow. He, he does it every year. It's just a passing fan. Anyway, and he spelled Klan wrong. Okay. The basis of the lawsuit is the GOPFacts.org accuses him of being in the KKK robes and calls Nolan one of Campbell County's most vehement racists. And he can't be a racist because a friend of his loves two of his black grandchildren. To death, one might even say. Combs said he hasn't seen the lawsuit. He said GOPFacts.org was started by him and a few other people. He said what's on GOPFacts.org was what was on Nolan's Facebook page. We just reprinted what he put up, Combs said. I think they might get away with that one. The picture, in part, got Nolan removed from the newly created Kentucky Boxing and Wrestling Commission days after being appointed by Governor Matt Bevin in May. The Trump campaign opted not to drop Nolan after he assured them he wasn't racist. Nolan's lawsuit stated, Nolan hopes to pursue a childhood passion for boxing as a promoter. Plaintiff has been forced to have uncomfortable discussions, he needs a safe space from these things, about the issue with newly acquainted colleagues and entrepreneurs in the boxing world who can kick his ass, no doubt. I mean, <laughs> that's the real problem. Oh, my God, I've just been exposed as a Klansman in this industry. And, oh, my God, if some of these people that I'm having to work with as members of this commission <clears throat> and as fellow promoters of the boxing industry aren't themselves a black and b capable of punching my face in but maybe not maybe they're all old white men walking on canes or whatever who knows <clears throat> he doesn't he's he's not a black boxer though 18 of his grandchildren whom he loves to death are no doubt uh black and probably also um republicans as well obviously, and uh, they're being persecuted, plus they're Jewish and veterans, just in case. I don't know. I need something else. Let's see. So he's been forced to have uncomfortable discussions about the fact that he showed up somehow in a KKK photo or didn't. It was just his friend who totally has black grandchildren. And uh, so let's see. Uh, unlike his longtime friends, I guess, these new newly, acqui newly acquainted colleagues and entrepreneurs in the boxing world, they do not have sufficient experience with plaintiff to know he is not a racist or a member of the KKK. That's what it says in the lawsuit. GOPFacts.org's homepage states its mission is to expose falsehoods, untruths, half-truths, quarter-truths, probably up to one-sixteenth truths, Rumors and all forms of deceptions from the Tea Party. Well, <clears throat> they're accurate there anyway. Uh, that's Republicans. The website makes accusations against several Tea Party leaders from Campbell County, including J.R. Roth, in case you're keeping score down there, Lloyd Rogers and Kevin Gordon, all of whom have black grandchildren that they love to death. It also has a video purported to be a rare behind-the-scenes look at Campbell County Tea Party, but in reality is a clip from the movie <laughs> downfall depicting Adolf Hitler's last days in the bunker. Busted! Ha <laughs> ha! They said it was a look inside the tea party in Campbell County, but it really is a movie about Hitler. Boy, those guys are liars. Well, gotta be careful out there, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so uh, anyway, 
Uh, this guy survives the purge of the Trump campaign. They decided they would stand by him. Now, back to the alleged crimes. These uh, alleged sex crimes were investigated by Campbell County Police, but Nolan was arraigned in front of Judge Elizabeth Chandler in Boone County District Court because Campbell County Circuit Court Clerk Tonya Nolan Jack is the daughter of the defendant who, as I remind you, served as a Campbell County judge from 1978 to 1986. Last November, Judge Nolan won a school board seat for a district with 5,000 students and 700 employees. He beat an incumbent with 10 years of school board experience and 27 years of experience as a teacher in the district by campaigning for so-called school choice vouchers and for the elimination of all local property tax revenue for schools. What a fantastic platform. In Kentucky, that works. 10 years on the school board, 27 years of experience as a teacher, that's all nothing. I will eliminate all taxes, give school choice vouchers with money we no longer have because we're giving away all the taxes, and I'm not in the clan, and neither is my friend with two black grandchildren. And what I bring to the table is I was once a judge, and now I want to run boxing matches. Not in school per se, but the thing is, I don't know. I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not a racist. Is that enough? Okay, let me in. And it worked because Kentucky is so smart. Rumors of the investigation surfaced in early April when Cincinnati Inquirer reporter Scott Wartman broke the news that Campbell County Police Chief Craig Sorrell had denied an open records request that sought documents involving any investigation of Tim Nolan. Is he in a clan? Does he have black grandchildren? Is he a racist? Is he a sex trafficker? We want whatever records you have. Answer, no. So I guess it's a good thing they brought him over to Boone County for his arraignment, not just because his daughter is the clerk of the court. In announcing the state's special prosecution division would be handling the case, the Office of Attorney General Andy Bashir, hey, stated that a core mission of Bashir's is to bring justice to the victims of rape, sexual assault, and human trafficking. And I guess they've got one here. Nolan is being tracked by a court-mandated ankle monitor. After being released on $50,000 bond, a preliminary hearing has been scheduled for May 5th in Boone District Court. And uh, I guess you can watch some kind of exciting video about the incident below. I assume that that is uh, perhaps his appearance in court as opposed to the alleged crime. I doubt very much whether Raw Story would post that as video. But hey, uh, things are crazy these days and you never know. <clears throat> All right. What else can we uh, start off the day with? Of course, it's Tuesday and we don't have Greg for our regular morning roundup. But uh, let's see. I have all sorts of fun things to share with you in pocket, of course, and uh, all sorts of happenings in the morning. So far, nothing that Trump has tweeted has disrupted our plans to simply go forward with the stories about how horrible he was prior to this morning. Though I do note that uh, Bill in Portland, Maine, who starts us out uh, each day with our morning tweet. Oh, and I forgot to read that one this morning, didn't I? Do I uh, do I have that handy? If I scroll back, I'm sure I can find it. But he also spotted something this morning that was rather interesting. Uh, was this? This must have been yesterday. Trump tweeting out today, meaning yesterday. I think I signed the Holocaust Remembrance Proclamation. And then he put up a Facebook video uh, proclaiming himself awesome for having signed it. But Bill notes, uh, in addition to all of his other ailments, our president has vision problems. He can barely read and is too vain to wear his giant Seinfeld glasses. That's very funny. And I don't know how big his glasses really are. But yeah, he definitely, he does need glasses to read. And I have seen him put them on in public. I, I must admit that uh, someone has shared that with me. And uh, I've seen it before, but he puts on like reading glasses. But uh, others have shared with me video from depositions where he refuses to read things that are handed to him, saying he forgot to bring his reading glasses with him. And I think he's just looking to avoid, well, for one thing, entering anything onto the record in his own voice that could be damaging to his case. And uh, in addition... Uh, he's not a particularly good reader, especially aloud. But in this particular video of him telling everybody how awesome he is for having signed the Holocaust Remembrance Proclamation, 
In addition to the puffiness and swelling around his eyes, which is now normally accompanying his, you know, is part of his everyday look, he's squinting terribly, I guess, to read a teleprompter from which he's giving his statement. And you can't, I mean, are there eyeballs in there at all? You can hardly see. Uh, the, the, the audio is not particularly impressive in any way. And, Except that it, it's read and it's it's got a comical nature in that it comes out in Trump's stupid "I'm reading a prepared text" voice. But I do note also for the record that even in this little bit where he's he's thanking the World Jewish Congress for their involvement in, or I guess for for forcing him to sign <laughs> the Holocaust Remembrance Proclamation, you know, and it's a Pretty standard thing. Presidents do that, and, and they usually probably do do it at the behest of the World Jewish Congress. And they show up and they get an Oval Office picture. Nothing out of the ordinary except that Trump is in it. But uh, interesting that he gives a little video speech about it, and I'm sure other presidents have done that too. And they talk about the Holocaust and the importance of remembering so that it never happens again. I have never seen anybody like Trump get a plug in for his huge, bigly, outrageous electoral victory into that speech. But he manages to do it. He's actually he's thanking uh, Ron Lauder of the Estee Lauder uh, Cosmetics Fortune for being a great friend of his as a Jewish person. And he even predicted very early my great victory in the presidential election. So he just wanted to get that in and on the record that uh, a Jewish guy thought he was going to win, so he can't possibly be anti-Semitic. He has uh, Jewish grandchildren, and he loves them to death. It's amazing how many parallels there are between him and this other guy who was just arrested for trafficking, uh, sex trafficking a minor, which, you know, I mean, many people have said, I myself have trafficked sexually in minors, but, uh, you know, uh, in that case, many people are lying. It's all fake news. And uh, he disclaims any knowledge of any of that. Okay, what else have we got here? Just, let's stick with the theme. It's an old Bill show. Bill, why don't you just call and do the rest of the show? Bill reminded me of this story today by sharing with me something from the Portland Press Herald. Is it the Portland paper? Yeah. Uh, the Press Herald in uh, Portland, Maine, has this Final chapter on a gun fail story I am pretty sure we brought up. One, because it was, you know, just an outrageous, dumb-ish sounding story. There was an ironic twist. It happened in in Maine. So I know that Bill noticed it. Columnist M.D. Harmon is a guy, a conservative pro-gun columnist, among other conservative issues he took up, who died after the gun he thought was unloaded. Went off. That's the headline. Columnist M.D. Harmon, not medical doctor. M.D. Harmon died after gun he thought was unloaded went off. And of course it went off because someone pointed it at him and pulled the trigger. But you'll see why it's just went off, I guess. The the point is that the person who shot him and killed him didn't mean to shoot and kill him. Didn't mean to shoot him at all. He thought the gun was unloaded. Now, why did he have the gun? Oh, you know... As people sometimes do, this, well, I'll tell you the story. I'll read you the story. Matt Byrne, staff writer at the Portland Press Herald, uh, does it this way. M. Day Harmon, the longtime Portland Press Herald main Sunday telegram slash main t- Sunday telegram columnist who died of a gunshot wound on April, uh, 27th of, oh, I'm sorry, 28th of December was killed when a gun he thought he himself had unloaded went off. How did it go off? It went off while, I'll tell you when it went off. It went off while being handled by a teenage family friend who had helped him move some furniture. Timmy, you ever seen any Gladiator movies? You ever seen a real 357 Magnum revolver? I don't know if it was the Magnum version of the revolver. I'm just saying it comes out naturally when people talk about 357s. Maine State Police said Monday that Attorney General's office, the Attorney General's office, will not pursue criminal charges because he was in the basement of Harmon's house for perfectly good reason, and his dad was around. I'm not saying the guy was a child molester. I'm just saying he's dead, and it's wrong to speak ill of the dead. So don't let me speak any. If you hear me speaking any ill, let me know, and we'll see what kind of medication we have for that. Harmon, 71, was in the basement of his home in Sanford with the son of a family friend 
when he unloaded a 357 revolver, 357 caliber revolver, and handed it to the teenager, who was unfamiliar with firearms, according to the report released by the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And it shouldn't make too much difference if you're, I mean, if you do things right, and somebody's unfamiliar with firearms, and you hand them an unloaded firearm, it should go okay, because it's uh, not loaded. But, but, one of the cardinal rules of gun handling and gun safety is you got to make sure the state of the weapon, and of course you treat all weapons as though they were loaded, even if you've just seen the owner of the gun allegedly. He's the real owner of the gun, but he allegedly unloaded it. He did unload it. He just did a bad job. He allegedly was competent in unloading it. He was not, as it turns out. But if somebody gives you a gun that you see them unload right in front of your eyes, it is still, strictly speaking, according to the proper gun handling protocol, when that gun is handed to you, you because you also are experienced in handling firearms, and I know you are, because I would never hand a firearm to someone, especially a teenager, who is totally inexperienced in handling firearms. So everyone's got to have a first time handling firearms, yes. But you might want that to be in a more controlled situation, perhaps at a firing range, perhaps only after a safety briefing, perhaps only after a reminder of the cardinal rules of gun safety, including... Treat all guns, all guns, even ones you've just seen unloaded as if they were loaded. And that would include things like pointing them at people who just gave them to you and pulling the trigger, which should be totally safe because unloaded. But even in, even if it isn't, if it's just maybe there's a mistake that's been made, maybe you could, if you want to pull the trigger, point that gun somewhere else and pull the trigger. Or maybe you should say, I ought not to pull the trigger. Or if I would like to pull the trigger, I should go to a range and pull the trigger there. Or something like that. But forget all of that because M.D. Harmon was a tough guy who knew about guns and knew what he was doing. So everybody shut up. So we'll now move on with the story. Harmon apparently had not emptied every chamber. Hmm. And when the boy cocked the firearm and pretended to shoot it, which is a thing that you let kids do when they have no experience with guns, the gun went off. Somehow, when he cocked the firearm and pretended to shoot it, that's when it happened. All according to the genius at the medical examiner's office, who really didn't even have to be much of a detective, did he? The bullet, the bullet struck Harmon in the neck and chest, damaging his carotid artery. Good shot for a kid who has no experience with firearms whatsoever. He died at the scene. We're, you know, appropriately distraught about that. I I feel like we're showing the right amount of remorse here. On the day of his death, there was a father, just some dude who is a father, and a teenage son, not necessarily paired, but that's the way it says it, who were friends and uh, helping the Harmons move some furniture. The most generous interpretation of that and the most likely what they intended was a father and that father's son, who are friends of Harmon's family, had helped him move some furniture and were there for that purpose. Although I got to tell you, that's a weird way of saying it. On the day of his death, there was a father and teenage son. I assume they're paired. They helped him move some furniture. That's what the report said. As partial payment, this is where it gets a little strange. Mr. Harmon offered the family a gun. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I literally can't quite figure out whether this is supposed to mean this gun will be yours now. I'm giving you a 357 as partial payment, which is an awfully strange thing to offer somebody with no gun experience whatsoever. I would like you to have experience with this gun. I'm not going to teach you. I'm just going to give you this one. And I'm not certain because the rest of the the rest of the context of the story seems to be like, well, one the, the partial payment is I hear you're interested in guns, but you have no gun experience and you know that I am an experienced gun owner. I uh, and maybe it would be fun as partial payment for me to show you the guns. I think that's a dumb thing to do, but some people think that's really entertaining. And, you know, uh, I don't want to question this free market exchange here, this this young man might have been very interested in guns. 
and lacking the experience, he was grateful for the opportunity to handle this 357. So anyway, the father suggested that his son, who was not familiar with guns, go to the basement so Harmon could show them to him, according to the report. Again, not clear whether that's the payment, he will show you guns, or whether I want to give you a gun as payment. Well, which gun should I take? I don't know. Why don't you go downstairs and choose one? I'll show them to you and you can pick one. It's never clarified. The father and son went downstairs to see the firearms and the father of the boy went back up the stairs. Why? Don't know. As he climbed the stairs, he heard a gunshot, the report said. Okay, everything seems to be pretty well in hand here. I'm just going to go upstairs and use the John if you guys don't mind. Uh, stay safe. I'll see you in about uh, a minute or two and then we'll head out. Okay, dad, what could go wrong? See you later. Blam. I didn't even make it up the stairs unless he had a huge staircase. It took him 15 minutes to climb the stairs from his subterranean bunker. You know, how many stairs are there up from the basement? Didn't even make it up the stairs. Bang. Police have not identified the teenager, but here's a hint for you sleuths in the audience. He's the son of the guy who was heading up the stairs. The medical examiner's report is the most detailed account of how the gun went off. Ready for this? Pull the trigger. According to the records, the teenager told police that Harmon opened the cylinder of the revolver and tipped the gun back to unload it. And that would generally do the trick with a revolver. But there's this other bit that, again, I don't have any revolvers. But the thing you're going to want to do then is tip the gun forward again and then look... At the cylinder. And uh, I mean, granted, that's no small undertaking. This, as it happens, was a 450 million chambered 357 Magnum. It could take all day to look at the, what, maybe six, eight, ten possibly chambers. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anything with more than that in revolver style. And I don't know whether, I, I don't know whether there's a standard across 357s, but it's less than ten. But he didn't bother. I tipped it back. I heard some tinkling and clacking of the uh, brass casings. And I figured the other guy hasn't made it up the stairs yet. So the tinkling noise isn't him in the bathroom. So it's empty. That's it. It's done. So then I'll just flip it closed without looking and then hand it back to this teenager who's never handled a gun in his life. And I don't know if I uh, finished my gun protocol speech as i was going to say but the proper protocol strictly speaking is somebody unloads a gun right in front of you and hands it to you you sit one you treat it as though it's still loaded and 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 that's a great overall rule not only so that you don't point it at somebody and pull the trigger and find out later that there was one round left in it but also if you treat it as loaded one of the things you're going to do when you're handed a gun I just saw it unloaded, but I know I'm supposed to treat it as loaded, is open it again. Inspect everything again. Make sure it's safe. Check the chambers. If it's a semi-automatic, make sure there's no magazine in it. Open the chamber. Pull back the slide. Make sure there's no bullet seated in the chamber. As is so often the case with semi-automatic weapons, I can't stress this enough, People take out the magazines all the time and accidentally shoot themselves or others because they forget that the reason they own a semi-automatic handgun is it's so easy and the, the, the next round goes up and is automatically fed into the chamber. <sighs> but okay, that wasn't happening here. This was a revolver. You simply open it. It would have taken two seconds, but he's not familiar with guns, so he doesn't know that he's supposed to inspect it himself. Someone hands you a gun they've just unloaded. You double-check their work. That's what it means to treat every gun as if it was loaded. You treat it as if the guy didn't just unload it. And you double-check, because maybe he missed one. And he did miss one, but he doesn't know that because he's inexperienced, so it's not really his fault. Oh, well, in a way, sort of, it's really Harmon's fault for giving a gun to somebody who wouldn't know what to do with it, including inspecting it, even if it's been handed to you unloaded. <sighs> so he hands it over to this teenager, but they point out the firearm examination, they took a look at the gun afterwards, indicates that while the bullets can be emptied, from the cylinder by tipping the gun, they do not consistently all fall out. 
he probably needed to clean this gun, but I don't want to even get into that. Uh, so this is all written by Dr. Margaret Greenwald, I guess the medical examiner, in a February 23rd report. There is also a safety that prevents the gun from firing unless the trigger is pulled. But of course, the trigger was pulled. Uh, and the report also shows that the gun has a lighter than normal trigger pull. So in other words, he got himself this big, manly, powerful handgun, but he took it to the gun shop and asked them, can you lighten the trigger pull here? Because there's a little a bit of a strain, this whole finger thing. And I'd like to be able to shoot others or get shot a little more easily than that. Thank you. Given the circumstances, the investigation by police and the firearms firearms examination, there is no evidence that the gun was fired intentionally. Now, that's a bit of a misstatement. I don't know whether Margaret Greenwald is a gun person or uh, I don't know what, but maybe, maybe not. But there is evidence that the gun was fired intentionally. The person holding the gun picked it up, pointed it, and pulled the trigger. What you mean is there's no evidence that Harmon was shot intentionally. And even there, you're going to have some difficulty. I mean, again, the guy did, the kid did point the gun at him and pull the trigger. It's just that he thought it was unloaded and didn't know that he was supposed to check it himself. At best, you can say it was never his intention to kill Harmon. And so fine. I mean, I don't think that's a bright way of handling it to say no charges. Just say, okay, no murder charges. But whatever. But the idea of, of coming to the conclusion that the gun was not fired intentionally is ridiculous. What? How much more do you need to know? He was handed a loaded weapon. He didn't bother to check to see whether it was loaded. And he pointed it at Mr. Harmon uh, thanks for the gun, Mr. Harmon. I appreciate it. I'm going to point this at you. And I guess at no point Harmon says, by the way, don't do that. And then he pulled the trigger. Bill has another question here and uh, says his question now is, why did Harmon casually keep a loaded gun in the house like that? That's also a huge gun safety. No, 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 sing. Okay. Uh, don't get me started. I'll never stop singing. You all know that about me. Probably not. Uh, why did he do that? It's Well, that's a matter of some dispute, of course. People who are safety-minded will remind you that the best way, of course, to store guns is separate, right, unloaded, for one thing, and separate from their ammunition. But among gun enthusiasts, there's a huge controversy. There's a, a, a sizable portion of the gun enthusiast community that will insist to you that a an unloaded gun kept at home, unloaded, is just basically an expensive rock. If you're looking to hit intruders over the head with a rock, you'll be fine. But if you're looking to use a firearm to protect yourself during an unexpected break-in or some other uh, unexpected danger arising at home, then an unloaded weapon, particularly one stored separate from the ammunition, is useless to you. And really, seriously, lots of people argue this all the time. There's no point in keeping an unloaded weapon at home. Uh, others differ, but I think I would guess that, I wonder, I don't know, I don't have any evidence, I don't have any data on what percentage of home or of gun owners practice this belief and and actually keep every gun unloaded i th i would suspect that a uh, that the majority of gun owners probably don't follow that rule and keep a loaded gun somewhere they might even have started out by keeping them separate but uh after two or three times of you know um waking up in the middle of the night having dreamt that you heard someone come into the house and then fumbling around to load a weapon before going down the stairs to check out the noise uh, they began to change the gun ownership in addition to a number of other things makes you paranoid to be quite honest. And, uh, I bet eventually most gun owners end up convincing themselves. Well, I'll just, I'll keep it either locked in a safe, but loaded with one of the people sometimes compromises. I want to keep it loaded and I'll keep it in a safe that has a fingerprint ID. You know, if you've got a couple of bucks to spare on these things, you know, a couple hundred dollars. I'll put it in a uh, a quick open lock that'll open with my fingerprint so I can grab it and it's ready to go. It's still not a good idea because it's really rarely a good idea to say, well, my plan is 
that if I ever wake up scared out of my wits and half asleep and drowsy and disoriented and maybe I don't have my glasses on and I'm in my pajamas and I got one slipper on if I jump out of bed and I want to run down the stairs, I want to have a loaded gun in my hand at all times when that happens. And I got lots of accidents that happen from that. But yeah, believe it or not, there's a lot of people who really think that their homes are safer if they keep guns around loaded all the time. And if they don't have kids, they convince themselves that that's even, even more, you know, well, even less unsafe, I guess I should say. Cause you don't, you know, uh, if it's just me and the wife in the old homestead, we both know not to pick this up and say, Oh, it's headphones. I'll stick it in my ear and then try and adjust the volume by pulling the trigger. No, you know, we're not going to have that problem. But then you usually end up in my gun fail list at that point when the grandkids come over. Even if they're black and you love them to death, they sometimes will fumble around with guns. Or the neighbor kid or the kid who's helping you move furniture shows up and you forget, hmm, the abiding rule in my house is that we uh, arm ourselves as though no children or no people inexperienced with firearms will ever enter our homes for any reason or go anywhere unexpected, either under our supervision or not. It's a terrible plan. It rarely works. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that. It, it frequently works almost all the time for almost everybody who practices it, which is, I guess, how it becomes so popular. And then one day it doesn't. And then we all say it's a terrible accident and that won't happen to me because I'm not negligent. That's gun fail. I think I just put that in a nutshell. I didn't plan to spend this long on it, but uh, as you know, a bit of a passion of mine. And this is such a perfect story for discussing these things. All right. Speaking of people who were pretty sure everything was going to go fine and there was just this one stupid freak accident and why are you harping on this and guns are totally safe and they make us safer. Let's go on. Harmon's wife, Margaret Harmon, said she did not want to comment on the death report, and I can't blame her for that, but said that her late husband was close with the teenager and they were talking normally. That is to say, no tension between them. It was clearly not intentional. But let's go, let's go beyond that. The son and my husband were good friends. That's interesting. Usually it's, the, I, I would have thought, my husband and the, the man, the father, were good friends and, uh, and, uh, you know, he was friendly with the son as well as the son of a good friend of his, but he's particularly, I don't know why you would emphasize that he's particularly good friends with the son, but I don't know all the totality of the circumstances. Perhaps they were active in scouting together. I don't know. Perhaps something else. Again, I'm just not sure. The son and my husband were good friends and they were just talking. Uh, apparently not about gun safety, but something else. Harmon, that's what uh, Mrs. Harmon said. It was just a normal friendship type thing. It's just, now she gets angry. You have no clue, none of you, what we've gone through. I just wish people would let this story go away. It's a very hard thing. And certainly the death is a hard thing. One of the things that probably makes it harder is that, no doubt, her husband is a big gun enthusiast, kept insisting how safe it really was and how... They weren't going to have accidents like that in all likelihood uh, because they were safe people and they practiced gun safety and they weren't dummies. And this wasn't going to happen as long as you're smart. And then one day, 71 years into it, he did something dumb and it, it caught up with him. But now I wish the story would just go away, like his practice of gun safety. It just went away one day and then all the things. And now I wish that would go away. Um I don't really know. I, and, and without assigning anything nefarious to it, there's no reason to do that. No reason to drag Harmon or his wife through the, you know, through the gutter and say that there was anything inappropriate about his relationship with this teenager. It's a little odd, but OK, things happen. Like I said, a perfectly ordinary explanation. Maybe he's, you know, maybe he had kids that went through a scout troop nearby. We have this. Very frequently, and they they go on, they they age out of scouts, they graduate from college, whatever. But the uh, the guy was scoutmaster for a while, and he remains uh, interested in the troop and helps out other kids to make it through scouts and have a good time, and offers their guidance. And we have lots of alumni parents or people who were 
scouts themselves and who just are enjoying being back and being involved with the scouts and there's nothing strange about it. I guess. I don't know. Inside, it certainly looks normal enough. To the outside, it might look a little odd. Anyway, what's not, to me, particularly normal is to say, you know, well, it was just a normal friendship type thing, right? They're just friends. Okay, fine. That's fine. Uh, the part that strikes me as something other than normal is, have you ever, have you ever been in a Turkish prison? That would have certainly been weird. Have you ever handled firearms? No? Would you like to? Yeah? Well, how about we do that? Well, okay, that's... Mm-hmm. See, now, in the scouting context there, you would say, we're going to have a shooting outing for the uh, troop. We're going to go. We're going to go to a certified gun range where there's lots of supervision and there's a very strict regimen of uh, uh, of safety briefings before anybody touches anything. You go through a whole rigmarole about gun safety because we don't want anybody shooting anybody accidentally. But apparently, in this guy's normal day, uh, you might include, hey, let's go down to the basement and I'll hand you a weapon. And, you know, I'm going to kind of try to unload it. We'll see how I do. And then when I do, why don't you do whatever the hell you want with it? Have you ever handled a gun before? No. Tell you what, I'll take the bullets out and then you just feel free. I don't care what you do. Ignore all gun protocol after that. I won't even tell you what gun protocol is, point it wherever you want, pull the trigger, cock it, whatever you feel like doing. You go for it. Because I'm not certain that when I unload something, it's unloaded. So there you have it. Harmon was, by the way, a longtime editor and columnist and an advocate of conservative views, including gun rights. He worked for the newspaper for 41 years. Could have been 42 or more, but it's limited to 41 now. The teenage boy and his father are both from North Berwick. So I think... Duck, if you're in North Berwick. Harmon graduated from high school in Pennsylvania. This is okay, fine. Before attending Bowdoin College in Brunswick, where he graduated cum laude in 1967. He served in the Army from 1967 to 1969, including a stint in Vietnam and the Army Reserves from 1970 to 75. Probably didn't even shoot anybody accidentally during that time. Harmon started his career at the Evening Express and the Press Herald in 1970, working as a reporter before becoming city editor, managing editor, and then an editorial writer. In retirement, he continued to write his weekly column and take on freelance assignments. So that humanizes him a little bit, I guess. That's the end of the story, and I guess there'll be no more reporting about the accident that killed M.D. Harmon, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I felt like we ought to spend a lot of time on it. If you ever find yourself, through whatever circumstances, and you might as, as imagine that it'll never happen to you, where somebody says, I've got a gun. You want to see it? I'm not telling you don't, but I'm telling you this. If they let you handle it, you need to say, hold it, hold it. Is this loaded or not? And they'll say, I just showed you that I unloaded it. And like, well, I read stories all the time about this. I hear these stories all the time. Can we double check it? If you don't know how to check it yourself, you know, you say, well, maybe this isn't a great idea. Or if if you still want to handle the gun, because I can see the temptation for it, right? Say, so, well, let's just double check it. Do me a favor. Send me automatic, or, uh, whether a revolver, any kind. Let's just check the, make sure we check the chamber. And if it's a revolver, all the chambers. One more time. Okay, great. Because I don't want to put a hole in your wall or in your floor or anything. Because I'm definitely not going to put a hole in you or me or anybody else here because I am not going to point this gun no matter how many times we check at anybody else and pull the trigger in fact i'm not going to point it at anybody else and not pull the trigger because i don't want anybody to trip with their finger out and fall and stick it through the trigger guard and accidentally pull the trigger while i have it pointed at something that's that's the rule every time the gun enthusiasts insist guns are perfectly safe if you just follow the rules of gun safety one keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot right that's not even number one number one is you treat all guns as if loaded two you don't point it at anything as they like to say that you're not willing to destroy that would include uh people's skulls but also antique vases or um oh i don't know gun safety manuals something like that anything you don't want to put a hole in you don't point it at and you know you don't want to put a hole in anything 
if you can help it. But uh, at best, maybe the ground would be your best bet, especially if you're actually outside. Now, if you're in an apartment, very frequently people think the wall or the ceiling or the floor is a quote-unquote safe direction, and they end up shooting people in the next apartment. But there's a lot to think about, is what I'm saying. So anyway, next time somebody offers you a, a gun, if you can't uh, overcome the temptation to fool around with it, and it is a big temptation. Those are Those are intriguing items. Just... Don't put your finger on it. Don't pretend to be shooting anybody. Double check everything. And then when you see it, go, wow, gee whiz, you know, and don't really necessarily want to put it in your hand and be going, freeze, uh, put your hands in the air, uh, make my day. Those are the sorts of things. Now, you're, you're once you start saying things like that, you know you're inching closer to doing something really dumb. That should be the signal to back off. That's it. That's the that's the gun story for the day. I wonder, it's probably another one, and I might stumble into it. But let's move on. Oh, no, I do have one more. Sorry. I knew there would be another one. Uh, here it is. There's a couple, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit it, I think, a little bit. Uh, one more installment in another ongoing gun saga. This is the ongoing gun saga of Tex McIver, the Georgia guy, Guns Everywhere Georgia, uh, the Georgian fellow who accidentally, and I guess this is coming under increasing question, accidentally shot and killed his wife, to whom he owed a tremendous amount of money, on their way back from a weekend at their ranch. Apparently they also, they lived during the week in a hoity-toity apartment in, story in the, since last fall. It the Buckhead Atlanta, section McIver, of Atlanta. Let me make sure that this auto-playing video stops. And uh, remember that this was the guy who... Uh, this uh, older couple that moved, coming back from their weekend country place to their hoity-toity apartment in Atlanta uh, and being driven home in an SUV by a, essentially by a chauffeur, somebody, a, a friend slash helper who they pay to shuttle them about and do various tasks for them. I don't know if they would necessarily have called her a chauffeur, but anyway, she, this other person was driving the car home and Mrs. McIver, I guess, was sitting in the front seat, the front passenger seat for some reason. And Mr. McIver in the back being driven around. I don't know what the situation was there, but that's what they did. And uh, remember that they were driving home and the story goes they were driving home through Atlanta, of course, and they had heard while they were away that there had been... Let me get the appropriate music for it. There had been over the weekend a Black Lives Matter demonstration. Yes. So, you know, murder is in the air. The Black Lives Matter folks were out and demonstrating, quote unquote, peacefully. But as you know, fomenting murder wherever they go. I mean, idiot. All right. So he's white. I don't know if I mentioned that. And since it's black lives that matter in these protests, everyone out there is an angry thug and probably looking to murder white people if if they happen to get the chance. They're not enterprising about it, seeking out white people to murder. But if one happens to wander accidentally into the protest, they would surely lose their lives. I think that's the belief that Mr. McIver was uh, uh, suffering under. And uh, so his story was, and I, I don't even know what to tell you. This story is so dumb. I think even then the cops immediately were kind of like, I think he wanted to murder his wife. We should look into this. But his story was, oh, my God, we are driving through the same city in which there was a demonstration the day before, peaceful demonstration uh, by uh, a group of black folks who were protesting how often people get shot. They will surely try to kill me now. I'd better take out a gun. He thought they were in some danger, perhaps, of running into this demonstration, which would still obviously be ongoing because it's a days-long riot, as opposed to let's get together and let our feelings be known and march and then, and then go home, which is what happened. But uh, So he decided, on our way home, I'd better... Go armed. I'm going to sit in the back seat. I'm going to have my gun loaded and at the ready, like Mr. Harmon. I can't wait 
to bring the uh, the the ammunition and gun together and load them in defense uh, from a riot. I have to be ready with my hand at the ready, the gun loaded, finger on the trigger, moment's notice. Got to be ready to kill instantly. I'm very nervous that we're driving home through riot-torn Atlanta, <laughs> which it wasn't. But if it was, why are you going? And uh, I'm so nervous, I got to have this gun in my hand. But I will also say this, it is extremely tiring to remain this nervous at all times. So I am going to close my eyes and catch 40 winks here on our way through the riot. But don't worry, if if there is a riot and they come to kill us, just wake me up because I'm ready to go. Guns loaded, it's in my hand, finger on the trigger. You just let me know as soon as I need to wake from from sleep and begin firing. Uh, I'm like, I'm your minute man, I'm the guy. So they're driving home, this is his story, and they hit a bump, a vicious black killer bump that was going to murder them. I'm practicing my uh, right-wing radio spiel here. Uh, and that bump forced Mr. MacGyver to fire the gun, or perhaps tricked him into firing the gun. He pulled the trigger, and the bullet uh, of its own volition then left the gun, went through the back, se- the front seat of the car, and through Mrs. MacGyver as well, uh, killing her. There's no, you know... Easier way of saying it. Shot her. She died. Now, later on when they discovered that he owed her a tremendous amount of money, I guess, uh, I don't know, if the initial story wasn't enough to make the police say, what? Why did? Why were you riding with a gun in your lap asleep in your own car? And also, this is your car. Why weren't you driving the car? Uh, I don't know. It, it sounds fishy. This shouldn't have happened this way. What kind of bump did you hit? I mean, holy cow. What's going on with the roads? in Atlanta, that this guy's gun goes off from going over a bump. But anyway, that was his story. So people weren't necessarily buying it, and the uh, local prosecutor was saying, you know, this is really something we're going to have to look into. I'll tell you what. We're going to have to charge you with some kind of crime here. We're going to conduct an investigation, and uh, we're going we're gonna to figure out exactly what happened here and uh, try to get to the bottom of this and see whether there was some other nefarious reason why you might have actually intentionally shot your wife. So, like everybody, you're innocent until proven guilty. I want you to post bond. I want you to go home, uh, await trial. And I'll tell you what, as another thing here we should do is I want all the guns removed from your home. While you're awaiting trial. Well, you know, Second Amendment rights. Go, well, look, look, you're under indictment here. I don't want anything bad happening. I don't want you falling into despair and killing yourself. None of that stuff. I want the guns removed from your home. Well, so we're back in the news. Why are we back in the news? Tex MacGyver wasn't having it. Yes, you can have take all my guns. Go ahead and do that. Uh, except for this one, apparently. This is this is a really weird thing. Uh, so here's a story from the local news down in Atlanta. DA hopes to revoke Tex McIver's bond over gun found in sock drawer. Where most people, I mean, people do keep them in the sock drawer. If you don't have kids and, uh, or feet, no one will go in your sock drawer. I guess there's that. But he, you know, he knows where the, where the gun is. Oh, but he says he doesn't. That's the interesting thing. A judge will on Monday, uh, set, well, uh, clearly something is wrong with this first sentence in the writing. The the editing in our newsrooms is going to hell. I'll read you what it says. A judge will Monday when to resume a hearing to determine blah, 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 blah. A judge will Monday? Well, don't Monday while I'm around. A judge will decide Monday when to resume a hearing to determine whether Tex McIver, the prominent attorney, attorney, accused of accidentally shooting and killing his wife, should head back to jail. I say now, but he says, let me let me think about it. The DA's office filed a motion to revoke McIver's bond because investigators found a gun in a sock drawer in his Buckhead condo. Buckhead with a B, 
<laughs> anywhere that Technicaver lives is an F head condo, but this one's in Buckhead. It was discovered Friday, April 14th, during a search for documents to be used as evidence in McIver's upcoming manslaughter trial. And documents, guns, uh, socks, all things likely to be in drawers, but they were being very thorough in their search. And they found a gun. His attorney, William Hill, is a, this attorney has an attorney. It's always wise. Do not represent yourself if you can afford it in any proceeding ever anywhere. But okay, surely not in a manslaughter trial. His attorney, William Hill, said no one knows how the gun got there. Even the laundry people don't know. Until now, McIver was under the impression that all guns had been removed from both his Buckhead condominium and his farm in Putnam County. He thought he had gone through that entire condo. The lady who helps clean. This is who we're talking about here. The lady who helps clean went through the entire condo. He went through his entire ranch, and he had the sheriff go through his entire ranch. Why? He was confident he had crossed all T's and dotted all I's, said Hill. So just by the way, he chauffeured back and forth. If you have a country place and a condo, and you can't be bothered to drive between them, then you don't need the two. But okay, some rich people, they like to be ferried back and forth. Apparently he's very rich, or at least his wife is very rich, and that was at the root of the problem why they're investigating these things it's got a lady that helps clean it's got a lady that helps drive them all over the place even the cleaning lady didn't know that there was a gun there which again okay fine i'm just saying that this is what april 14th he shot his wife let's see gosh this would have been back as the date in here yeah september 25th of last year so here's the deal from september 25th to April 14th, Tex McIver never wore socks. That's what he's having to say here. Either that or I, it show, from Janu- from September 25th to April 13th, I faithfully wore socks. Three pair a day. That gun was not there. On Friday the 14th, somebody planted that gun in my sock drawer. That's what he's, that has to be the story. Because otherwise, you know, I mean, if you say, well, I put it in my in the drawer where I keep my stamp collection and I've been so distraught since my wife died, I haven't even been interested in my stamp collection. So I missed this one. Your sock drawer, your underwear drawer. I you know, I never go in there. I have people who go get my socks for me. Maybe he does. I don't know. But it seems to me like you're not going to miss a gun in your sock drawer for how long? September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Seven months in his sock drawer. I never saw it, Your Honor. I didn't. Have, I had no idea. I very frequently, you know, I thought it was. I thought it was a sock. I thought it was a gun sock. I have a lot of decorative socks. Some of them are decorated with gun motifs. I thought it was another one of those socks. Black socks? I wouldn't doubt it. Right? He's seventy-one years old. The guy probably has a lot of black socks. So. Maybe it was harder to see. In my sock drawer, it would stand out. I got a lot of white socks. I'm a casual dressing guy. Got some gray socks that I wear daily. You know, and you didn't need to know this about me. But I think pretty well, I think our gun would be pretty clearly delineated from my sock drawer. Although it is very crowded. It's very difficult. I just got a new bunch of socks. They're really great. uh, But there's hardly any room left in my sock drawer. I would probably have to put the gun somewhere else. It's too low. The kids would be able to get to it. Lots of problems with my sock drawer. But that's that's the guy's claim here. In seven months, I never saw this thing in my sock drawer. This guy's story is falling apart worse every time he opens his mouth. So let's see. Where are we? His attorneys will likely try to show that MacGyver has a lot of living space to keep track of. He originally had about 20 guns he needed to remove. you got to have one in every corner of your living space. And in Hill's opinion, it would be easy to miss one. Uh, it might be we really ought to be requiring that gun owners keep better track of how many guns they own. When you own too much of something that you start losing track of how many you even have, problematic. But people do collect, and I don't know. I mean, you can't necessarily have a one-size-fits-all sort of situation. But again, sock drawer. It's in your, your effing sock drawer, man. How do you miss that? A lot of living space, but you're in your sock drawer every day. I don't know. 
this is my special sock drawer. I only, this is my, uh, oh, that's it. This is my spring and summer socks. That's what it is. I've been in my winter sock drawer this whole time, fall and winter. Hmm. Well, I think I just solved that mystery. I mean, I assume you all have seasonal sock drawers like I do. Anyway, it would be easy to miss one. As a conditioner, uh, a condition of MacIver's bond, he's not allowed to have a firearm in his possession, which arguably he did not. He didn't even look in his sock drawer. It's hard to say that was in his possession if he didn't even know it was there. The hearing began around 4 p.m. Friday and after listening to testimony for about two hours. So if you think I, you know, boy, he, I, I can go on forever about a stupid story like this. They went two hours on this one. The judge chose to continue it next week. They wanted even more time to be spent on it. Until the hearing is complete, MacGyver is allowed, not allowed, to travel to the Putnam County Ranch, nor will he be able to contact the sheriff there. So that's interesting. And the, oh, just the hearing. Okay, so it's not even that he hasn't been able to go to the Putnam Ranch. So that would mean he's definitely in the sock drawer every day, assuming he wears socks. And maybe he's one of those guys. During the hearing, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office filed another motion to remove Tex MacIver as the executor of his wife's estate, a motion to which MacIver visibly reacted. Uh, just by way of background on the story it provides here, MacIver is accused of shooting and killing his wife Diane last September while the two were driving back or being driven back from their Putnam County farmhouse. I assume they do an awful lot of farming at their farmhouse, too. It goes through socks like you won't believe. According to police, Diane MacIver was shot while sitting in the passenger seat of her Ford Expedition the evening of September 25th. Her husband, attorney Tex MacIver, was sitting directly behind her in the back seat. Like like the Godfather. There's some question about what happened to the cannoli, but that was the seating arrangement. Diane MacIver's best friend of 30 years, whom he only identified as Danny Joe, was driving. I don't know whether that's the woman who helps with the cleaning or not, but Danny Joe was doing the driving. The three took a detour off I-85 downtown and got off at the Edgewood Avenue exit. Tex, who was sleeping in the back, asked for his gun because he didn't think it was a safe area. Anybody in Atlanta want to tell me about Edgewood Avenue exit off I-85? After falling back asleep in the back seat because he was so worried about the safety, he woke up to the sound of a gunshot. No wonder he was scared. He's right. It was a terrible area. Oh, he woke up to a gunshot and he realized he had pulled the trigger. Okay. After Diane McIver was shot by him, but that is after Diane McIver was shot, she's the agent in all this. She was driven to Emory Hospital in DeKalb County where she died. Oh, by the way, uh, the uh, part of the original story is, and, and I guess if you're familiar enough to know whether or not the Edgewood Avenue exit off I-85 is or isn't a bad neighborhood, then you probably also know, as the prosecutor said, that Emory Hospital in DeKalb County, not the closest hospital to the Edgewood Avenue exit of I-85. Uh, what happened here is he said, oh, my God, my wife's been shot. Take me to the whitest hospital you can find. I know, Emory. And I, I don't know, maybe maybe there's whiter hospitals, but at least take me to a whiter hospital than the one near Edgewood Avenue, for God's sake. Tex says he'll never forget when doctors told him his wife was dead. They're walking straight at you and you dis distinctly, distinctively turn around. That's instinctively. But he says distinctively turn around to see if there's anybody behind you. They might be walking to and you realize you're the only one in the waiting room. They come right up to you, and you know exactly what they're going to tell you. Tex told CBS 46 News back in December. I feel bad for him having to uh, deal with this situation, but uh, I don't know. It's starting to sound like maybe his story isn't super straight. Uh, Real Jingy is out there having a good time with this story. Uh, that's for sure. This gun must have been planted recently in my spring or summer sock drawer in my condo. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying the story. It's, it's a real tragedy and you shouldn't, this is really reflects poorly on you. <laughs> this is all your fault. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes these things, it's just got to be discussed this way. I may be a terrible person, but there's only 50 minutes left of it today. So there is that. Uh, let's see other interesting gun stories. This one I'm not going to do, but I want to acknowledge, uh, uh, 
that I that at least that I got this one from uh, Des Moines Dem, the uh, author of Bleeding Heartland blog uh, and a frequent follower on Twitter. And maybe you follow as well. But uh, just uh, noting that uh, one more loosening of firearms laws under consideration out there in Iowa and two that the local media not covering the story particularly well. The Bleeding Heartland entry here noting that generally accepted journalism guidelines call for acknowledging mistakes in news reports. I don't make any mistakes, so I don't I don't have to do that. Setting the record straight quickly and doing so in a way that encourages people who consume the faulty information to know the truth. The online news association's Build Your Own Ethics Code project lists promptly correct errors among the short list of fundamentals that should apply to all journalists, but I guess it didn't apply in this case to KWWL, the NBC affiliate in Waterloo. Uh, they ran what he says is an inaccurate story from beginning to end about how the Iowa House and Senate will soon wrap up a session in which they passed more far-reaching changes to state law than any other cohort has done since the Democratic majorities of 1965, including some stand your ground legislation that uh, got what he says is some very slanted coverage. W K W W L ran a story by Taylor Bailey explaining stand your ground two days after governor Terry Branstad had signed the bill into law. That was house file five one seven as they style it there. The online version uh, offered to people was largely the same. There was a couple of changes made at the last minute. Uh, and apparently they said, uh, the stand your ground law is months away from taking effect in Iowa. Lawmakers say it will allow people to use deadly force to avoid injury or possible death. Taylor Bailey was learning more about the bill, joining them live in the newsroom with more. Uh, Bailey tells the audience, some of these new bills may be confusing to understand, but, uh, they'll explain them all. They're cut and dry. And uh, you no longer have the duty to retreat if you're confronted with a situation, is their explanation of stand your ground, which mm, I guess, I don't know, I'm not sure how uh, the new law reads here, but uh, I'd like to spend some time kind of digesting that. But uh, my guess is that uh, between that and reporting about how statistics say that guns will help keep you safer and everything is fantastic and you no longer have to uh, back down from anything. Stand your ground means you can intervene in any situation that you feel confident you can put right with your gun. Go for it. And that's probably a bad way of explaining stand your ground. There's much more to the story here, but I do want to move on from the gun topic. But I do want to thank Des Moines Dem for having sent this one to us and asked us, if we might be interested in taking the subject up, I think perhaps on another day. Let's see. Uh, I'll set, you know, and I'll set this one aside for those of you who've uh, got the time to read through it and get up to date. And maybe you're in Iowa and you want to know exactly what's going on and what garbage you might be getting fed in your daily news watching habit. Uh, let's see. The, there's plenty of good fake news out there that we can take up. Let's see. And in fact, an interesting report on some of the latest and most egregious examples of fake news websites that still survive, thrive, and make a profit online through Facebook and the ad placement game, the ad placement arbitrage game. Uh, BuzzFeed has an interesting look at what is probably the, currently the most vile of them. Uh, run from Eastern Europe, unsurprisingly, uh, a place called, what do they call it? True Trumpers. Is that the name of their, uh, site? True Trumpers. Is it dot com? I don't know if I want to like direct anybody to find the thing, but, uh, yes, they, uh, they're running fun headlines like, yeah, there's two tr true Trumpers dot com running fun headlines like breaking Muslim refugees kills and this is all typos that are original to the text. Muslim refugees kills 30 people in Michigan because Trump bombed Syria. Would you support Trump if he hang them? Asked a recent typo laden headline shared by the page. This is the sort of thing. And almost all of them tend to be blaming some vicious crime or another with a picture lifted from somewhere totally unrelated to, to news in any form. 
Uh, but they show a picture of, you know, kids with black eyes and say, Muslims beat this child. Would you support Trump if he hanged them? Over and over, that's the, the question. Would you support it if they hanged him, if they deported him, if they executed him? Really, uh, really fun stuff. Really, truly enjoying what uh, our fellow human beings are doing to one another in the name of profit from clicks on advertising. Okay. Whew. Uh, let's see. Speaking of, uh, let's get to other stories. One of the things I meant to cram into yesterday's show, as we were discussing his, uh, President Trump's horrific interview with the AP. And again, uh, I'm going to skip over reading through that again. I may never do that. That's just too long and too full of crazy, too discouraging. But, uh, my discussion of it, uh, the other day, um, well, uh, we, we touched on it and, uh, it, and, and in discussing it online, there were a few things that stood out and, uh, discussing it on Twitter. And I think Daniel Dale does a great job. I mentioned his small tweet storm on the subject and, uh, I think he hits all the highlights or at least, uh, I agreed with many of the, the, the sections that he decided to highlight. Uh, one of them that, uh, I, I thought was really interesting was he's discussing, he's discussing the Supreme Court here. Uh, Daniel starts out by saying this. Trump boasts that he appointed a Supreme Court judge, even though he didn't mention a judge in his 100 day plan. The reporter who's doing the interview informs him that he did, but that wasn't even what was most striking about this section to me. But let me read you this bit of transcript. The AP reporter says, so in terms of the 100 day plan, that you did put out during the campaign. Do you feel, though, that people should hold you accountable to this, to this in terms of judging success? And re- you'll remember that uh, last week Trump was all about distancing himself from the hundred days thing, even though he made the biggest deal of anybody out of the hundred days. And uh, uh, granted, he's right, or that is, he's not wrong about the one hundred days thing being an arbitrary measure that's just essentially worthless. But he loves it because it's quantitative. And it feels like ratings to him. How did I do in my first hundred days? He wants to know how he did on every day, but hundred days makes sense to him. But now that he's a flop, he wants to distance himself from it. But occasionally he brings it back up even now, even as he's trying to distance himself from it in order to brag on something. So should you be held accountable? Uh, Trump, no. <laughs> no, because much of the foundation's been laid. Things came up. I'll give you an example. I didn't put Supreme Court judge on the 100-day plan, and I got a Supreme Court judge. All right. Uh, he says it in a different way, somewhere slightly different in the transcript, but uh, I'll stop there, even though that's not the point of this uh, this screen grab. The point of this screen grab is, he says, I did a Supreme Court judge, even though I didn't say it in my 100-day plan. And the AP then says, I think it is on there. Trump says... I don't know. AP reporter then reads it to him. Begin the process of selecting. You actually exceeded on this one. This says begin the process of selecting a replacement. So in his 100-day plan, he actually did, in fact, put that in there. And he forgot because he's both dumb and didn't really write the 100-day plan himself. So he would have had no idea that it was likely in there. But that that's not even something that belongs in your 100-day plan. Of course, you, if there's a Supreme Court vacancy, of course you're going to fill it. That's the point of being president. And he goes on somewhere else and says, by the way, it wasn't in my plan, but it was. But uh, filling a Supreme Court vacancy, he says, for some reason, he puts it this way, is one of the highest callings of a presidency. It isn't. I mean, it's very important, certainly a very important and integral part of a presidency. One of the most important things that's at stake in an election. Yes. But I mean, is it the highest calling? I mean, defending the nation, I think what most people would agree is the highest calling or something like that, as opposed to naming a Supreme Court justice. In addition to which, he then goes on to brag in this slightly different section that, uh, you know, hardly sometimes people don't even get to name Supreme Court justices for a long time. I did it. I did it in day in 70 days. I did it. Now, mind you, that's not a particularly difficult accomplishment to to 
one, to, to nominate somebody to the court, and two, if you have a majority that's willing to go nuclear, get them uh, uh, confirmed to the Supreme Court. He didn't really do anything in any of this. And just I was looking at the way he even approaches this, like I did it faster than anybody. Uh, the 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 vacancy was open for a year. The Republicans in the Senate did everything they could to keep it open. It was in your 100-day plan. Nobody puts, I'm going to nominate a Supreme Court justice in their plans at all because you can't plan for that because people don't retire or die on schedule. You wouldn't put that in a 100-day plan unless, of course, you were conscious of the fact that Republicans were screwing with every single possible part of our system of governance in order to keep that vacancy open for you. I mean, it's extraordinarily unusual circumstance at all that anybody would think to put that in a plan of any sorts because you don't have those vacancies staring you in the face. But what a weird way of putting it. Like, I did it faster than anybody. You were handed a vacancy that didn't belong to you, and it still took you 70 days to get the job done. That's actually a terrible record. Anyway, there's more that he calls out here. Trump claims that he never heard of WikiLeaks, somehow, (laughs) the subject of major controversy for years. He never heard about them until they released the Clinton camp emails. That's possible. He's a pretty ignorant guy. Uh, AP uh, says, uh, let's see, your attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is taking a tougher line suddenly on Julian Assange, saying that arresting him is a priority. You were supportive of what WikiLeaks was doing during the campaign with the release of the Clinton emails. Do you think arresting Assange is a priority for the U.S.? Trump says, when WikiLeaks came out, never heard of WikiLeaks, never even heard of it. When WikiLeaks came out, all I was saying is, well, look at all this information here. This is pretty good stuff. You know, when they tried to hack the Republican, the RNC, but we had good defenses. They didn't have defenses, which is pretty bad management. And it goes on from there. But again, the incon- the incoherence. I mean, I can't blame them terribly. I change directions in my sentence all the time. It's just weird to see it this way. Usually they clean this stuff up. When WikiLeaks came out, all I was just saying is, well, look at all this information here. This is pretty good stuff. You know, they tried to hack the Republican, the RNC, but we had good defenses. Eh, minor thing. And again, something I'm guilty of myself, the way he changes directions in his sentences. Let's see. Other things that Daniel Dale highlighted, and I'm going to use him as a guide on this. Trump explains that he only called NATO obsolete because he didn't know much about NATO. They had a quote from me that NATO's obsolete. But they didn't say why it was obsolete. It was on, I was on Wolf Blitzer, very fair interview. The first time I was ever asked about NATO because I wasn't in government. People don't go around asking about NATO if I'm building a building in Manhattan, right? So they ask me. Wolf asked me about NATO. NATO, as he likes to sometimes say. And I said two things. NATO's obsolete. Not knowing much about NATO. Now I know a lot about NATO. NATO is obsolete. And I said, and the reason it's obsolete is because of the fact that they don't focus on terrorism. You know... Back when they did NATO, did, back when they did NATO, there was no such thing as terrorism. Of course, there was, but uh, whenever he starts a sentence or a throwaway line with, you know, he's just learned that thing, you know, and, and it's, he's wrong. Too. You know, back when they did NATO, established, chartered, founded, not, did. Okay, sure. Trump, doing his standard many people projecting, says most people don't think about Canada when they're thinking about NAFTA. AP is asking him here, what, what about NAFTA? What's the plan on NAFTA? Would you like, what would you like to know? I would like to know what your plan is in terms of renegotiating. Okay, fair enough. What's your plan on NAFTA? What do you want to know? Your plan on NAFTA? Oh, I see. I am very upset with NAFTA. I, I think NAFTA has been a catastrophic trade deal for the United States. Trading agreement for the United States. Another another stupid, what, sentence? I can't even follow this guy. I think NAFTA has been a catastrophic trade deal for the United States. Trading agreement for the United States. It hurts us with Canada and it hurts us with Mexico. Most people don't even think of NAFTA in terms of Canada. You saw what happened yesterday in my statements because if you look at the dairy farmers in Wisconsin and upstate New York, 
they are getting killed by NAFTA, are they? Trump absurdly claims nobody before him has ever asked the Prime Minister of Italy to increase defense spending. I've developed great relationships with all these leaders. Chef Boyardee, fantastic guy. Spaghetti, love it. Italian ice, the best. Pavarotti, great friend of mine. Nobody's written that. In fact, they said, oh, well, he's not treating them nicely because on NATO, I want them to pay up. But I still get along with them great, and they will pay up. In fact, with the Italian prime minister yesterday, you saw we were joking. Come on, you have to pay up. You have to pay up. He'll pay. We were joking. I kept saying you have to pay up. He kept saying, I don't know what the hell with this guy. Who is this jerk? I Oh, it was very funny. We were just joking. Uh, did he say that in your meeting, your private meeting? He's going to end up paying. But, you know, nobody ever asked the question. Nobody asked. Nobody ever asked him to pay up. So it's a different kind of presidency. It is true. It's a different kind of presidency. You have me there. Uh, I kept saying to him, you're going to pay up, pay up. We were just joking. Did he say he was going to pay up? He didn't say he was going to pay up, but he will pay up. He just didn't say it. But he did. But he did. Trump gets even more brazen, Dale says, with his repeated lie about his single-handed achieving of F-35 savings. Oh, yes, I remember this one. I saved $725 million on 90 planes. Just 90. Now, there are 3,000 planes that are going to be ordered. On 90 planes, I saved $725 million. It's actually a little bit more than that. (laughs) How much is it then? But it's $725 million. How do you like that? It's actually more than that, but it's the same number. Again, why? what? General Mattis, who had to sign the deal when it came to his office, said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. We went from a company that wanted more money for the planes to a company that cut. And the reason they cut, same planes, same everything, yes, was because of me. I mean, because that's what I do. Trump calls the media very stupid for pointing out his flip-flop on Chinese currency, wrongly suggesting that devaluation only stopped under him. Uh, and uh, you know what? I don't even need to need, need to read all of these things. There's also, uh, Dale says, uh, this is the one we talked about yesterday, the AP having to say he was unintelligible, even though it was a one-on-one Oval Office interview. Trump made at least 15 unintelligible comments in his Associated Press interview, according to their transcript. Trump also claims the border wall will cost less than $10 billion, but it might be more. That's also a great statement. It might be more, though, if I do a super duper. (laughs) That one got a lot of notice. You think $10 billion or less? I think $10 billion or less. And if I do a super duper, higher, better, better security, everything else, maybe it goes to be a little more. But it's not going to be anywhere near those kinds of numbers. I guess the kind that were cited earlier. And they're using those numbers. They're using the high numbers to make it sound impalatable. Uh, okay. Unpal- unpalatable? Impossible? I'm not sure where he was going with that one. Probably unpalatable. And the, the fact it's, and the fact it's going to cost much less money. Just like the airplane I just told you about, which I hope you can write about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, let's see. Does he point out any other ones? I mean, I think those are the highlights. And there were a lot of uh, people doing highlight, low-light reels on this thing. Um, but the discussion of it and the mockery of it on Twitter on Sunday night led me to this. Someone shared this interesting article with me. I thought you weren't supposed to do this stuff. Let's figure out what this is all about here. New York Magazine, Gail Sheehy has this piece here at Yale psychiatrists cite their, quote, duty to warn about an unfit president. Yikes. But I guess, hmm. Well, let's see what their explanation is for this thing. Batty, says Maureen Dowd, nut job, Gail Collins offers, unhinged, delusional, deranged, sadistic, oh, sexual predator. That got thrown in there, too. These are only a few of the labels slapped on Donald Trump by pundits, national security chiefs, even U.S. senators. Yet, most members of one profession have been hiding in plain sight. Psychiatrists and psychologists operate under a norm, the so-called Goldwater Rule, that their professional organizations made up in 1973, forbidding them from diagnosing public figures they haven't been able to evaluate in person. We've all heard that. That's the usual practice with 
doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists. In the face of minimal trust at home and abroad and President Donald Trump's stability and his tenuous grasp of reality, a group of eminent professionals are daring to depart from the party line and declaring exception to the rule. The Hippocratic Oath to First Do No Harm, sworn to Apollo the Physician, has been turned into a self-serving hypocritical oath, charges Dr. John Gartner, a psychologist and former faculty member at Johns Hopkins Medical School. It's an interesting way of putting things. The American Psychiatric Association looks out for the welfare of its members, protecting them from lawsuits. They're not worrying about whether 300 million Americans are vulnerable to the life and death actions taken by this abnormal president. Ah, that's a better point. And he and an increasing number of his colleagues are ready to declare that President Trump, whose actions are often described with neutral terms like unprecedented, is in fact dangerously ill. Does Trump need to lie to my face for me to know he lies all the time? Asks Gartner. That's a good point. Now in private practice in New York City, he answers his own rhetorical question, which he wouldn't have done in Baltimore, I assume. He does lie to my face. Every night I watch TV. <laughs> that sounds like something Trump himself would say. I watch TV. I saw it on TV. That was in my face. This moment, which itself is unprecedented, led to an open town hall meeting on Thursday at Yale Medical School to discuss the elephant in the room. Dr. Brandy X. Lee a diminutive Yale psychiatry professor who organized the meeting, puts it this way. The Goldwater Rule is not absolute. We have a duty to warn about a leader who is dangerous to the health and security of our patients. And I guess everybody else in the world. She has formed a coalition by that name, and it now comprises almost 800 mental, mental health professionals who are, quote, sufficiently alarmed that they feel the need to speak up about the mental health status of the president, unquote. Gartner has posted a similar petition on the web, and it has attracted 41,000 signatures, a high proportion of them from mental health practitioners. Anyone can look it up and sign it. Duty to warn is a term with some history. In 1974, a trial known as the Tarasov case established the law, now in force in 38 states, saying, that if a patient is in imminent danger of physically hurting someone, his or her doctor may break confidentiality and alert the likely victim or call the police. As for the Goldwater Rule itself, it is essentially a gag order, part of the Code of Ethics of the American Psychiatric Association. It was created in the years after the 1964 presidential election when the fiery conservative Barry Goldwater, fiery won the Republican nomination. Goldwater ran on anti-communist rhetoric, suggesting that he might just start a nuclear war on the slogan, in your heart, you know he's right. Lyndon Johnson's counter slogan was, in your guts, you know he's nuts. Press outlets, notably a magazine called Fact, asked psychiatrists and psychologists to diagnose Goldwater, and they did enthusiastically, enthusiastically and damningly. Goldwater sued fact and won. The APA set down its rule a few years later. It is only fair to point out that professional organizations governing mental health practitioners still do not have a clean blotter. Only in 1968 was the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders rewritten for its second edition to drop the grievous classification of nonconformists such as homosexuals under sociopathic personality disorder. Two contract psychologists devised the CIA's Enhanced Interrogation Program, acknowledged by President George W. Bush. The American Psychological Association has admitted that key officials secretly, quote, colluded with the Department of Defense officials to loosen ethical guidelines, unquote, motivated by the wish to, quote, curry favor with DOD. Only in 2006 did the APA strictly prohibit psychiatrists from participating in enhanced interrogations. The event at Yale this week did not come about without controversy. It had been arranged jointly by Yale's School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, and School of Public Health. All three dropped away before the big day. Asked why, a spokesperson for the university says only eminent psychiatrists who were invited to speak about whether there are other ethical rules that override the rule 
in ordinary practice. The university upheld a commitment to free speech by giving Lee permission to hold an independent meeting in the auditorium of the medical school, but she was largely on her own. I'm a pariah in my own department, Dr. Lee confided to me before the event, but she's not the one to back down. As a Korean-American girl growing up in gang territory in the Bronx, that's what it says, she saw kids caught in crossfire all the time. As an Asian girl in New York, then she recalls, I didn't belong anywhere, so I could go anywhere. And so she did, secretly volunteering in Harlem as a tutor for homeless children. Okay. After Yale Medical School and her residency through Harvard, she studied the anthropology of violence in East Africa. There, she had a revelation. Tribal warfare wasn't about gaining military superiority. We know from violence studies that it's inequality, the shame of powerlessness, that pushes people to resort to violence. Years of working in maximum security prisons have reinforced her belief that most inmates fight to preserve a sense of dignity and belonging. Despite the fact that it destroys their chances in life, they continue to resort to violence in order to belong to a subculture where their status is defined by violence. Do Trump's middle-class supporters see him as a strong man who promises to revive the status they have lost? I asked her. In their sense of be- is their sense of belonging tied to Trump? She agreed. He is giving his fans a false sense of empowerment. Make America great again. Reject outsiders who will take your jobs. But instead of elevating their status with real solutions, he's exploiting their psychology. The Yale town meeting itself was, after the sponsoring departments pulled out, sparsely attended. And that's, I guess, important to note, right? All this, it doesn't, with the numbers, the signing of the petitions, etc., it sounded like it was going to be a big affair, and it's not. Sparsely attended, it started late, not many more than a dozen seats were filled, though about 60 viewers tuned in from around the country. Harkness Auditorium holds about 400 people, so what did they get, a dozen out of the 400? But a special guest via video monitor piped in from his study in New York, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, former Yale professor of psychiatry and author of the Ur text about the way Nazi doctors were perverted into killers. Hmm. He's 90. His full-lipped smile, evident at the start of his talk, went slack as he spoke. He told the tiny audience he had an important concept to discuss, Malignant normality. Lifton defines it as arrangements put forward as being normal when in fact they are dangerous and destructive. Hmm. Now there's a construct we might be interested in. An extreme example on which he has done studies, there we are, figuring out my way through that sentence, is that of German doctors who were assigned to Auschwitz. Their job was to be active in the mass killing. They were given perverted training to defeat their fears and shame and brainwash them into believing it was normal to gas Jews to death. As it's worth noting, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad must do something similar to normalize the gassing of babies and women by their countrymen in his army. Uh Uh-oh, it's a comparison between Hitler and Bashar al-Assad, but I don't know if it's a problematic one. It seems like the right one. Dr. Judith Herman spoke next. She's a renowned professor of psychiatry trained at Harvard and Cambridge. And after Trump's election, she wrote a letter to President Obama expressing alarm at the symptoms of mental instability she saw in the president-elect. Was there some way to insist on a neuropsychiatric evaluation, she wrote, before this man assumes the terrifying power of a U.S. president? Only two of her colleagues were willing to co-sign the letter, which went viral and was read at the Women's March on Washington. Dr. James F. Gilligan, a senior clinical professor of psychiatry at NYU Medical School, was on next and noted that while speculative diagnoses of Trump have been made, one does not need a diagnosis to assess dangerousness. Anyone who doesn't flatter him extravagantly is meant to be destroyed. He engages in exploitation and violation of the rights of others, and sometimes he goes as far as sadism with no evidence of remorse. When you add all these elements, Gilligan observed, this is a class of people of whom Hitler is a member. Only at the end did Gartner introduce a note of Gallo's humor. Imagine tomorrow's grandparents, he suggested, stuck in a refugee camp in icy Idaho, 
trying to warm their hands over a fire while asked to explain it all to the grandkids. Grandpa, you knew there was something, there was a dangerous man running our country. Why didn't you say something? Well, you see, in 1967, there was a lawsuit brought by a candidate for president called Barry Goldwater. Wait, Grandpa, what's a lawsuit? Chagrined, the grandfather tries to explain that a magazine had warned that Goldwater was unstable and had been sued. Wait, Grandpa, what's a magazine? After the session ended, Lifton spoke to me and I asked whether he sees Trump as an abnormal personality. Trump creates his own extreme manipulation of reality, he explained. He insists that his spokesmen defend his false reality as normal. He then expects the rest of society to accept it, despite the lack of any evidence. Lifton is unexpectedly insouciant when he speaks, and you can see it in the bushel of white hair that still flops over his forehead and ears, plus that half-lipped smile. I pressed him to interpret the angry meltdown that seized President Trump when he was told, after the fact, that his closest campaign cohort, Jeff Sessions, had recused himself from the Justice Department investigation of Trump's Russian connections. Trump's version of reality did not include Sessions having done anything wrong, he explained, despite evidence of his reported contacts with the Russian ambassador. Trump himself, he explained, cannot bear the humiliation of being exposed as wrong and is ultra-sensitive about the Russian connection. He's more than a little threatened by the idea of a full independent inquiry. A sudden influx of new information about his business holdings could create an explosive situation. Can our institutions that guarantee a separation of powers survive such a manipulative presidency? Open institutions are still in effect, but he's doing his best to ignore them and break them down, said Lifton. Trump is a person bent on authoritarian behavior. He continued with a sobering quote from the contemporary poet Theodore Rothke. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. Interesting. uh, An interesting side note, I think, to the whole controversy. Uh, And uh, I think probably more and more practitioners will become comfortable with saying, at the very least, as other people did, that you don't necessarily need to have a one-on-one examination in order to diagnose the fact that there's some danger involved here, whether or not you can clinically diagnose his ailments, if any, I am not sure. But I'm not certain that you need to do a physical examination or in-person examination with Guy to know whether, A, he's a habitual liar. That you can pretty much figure out uh, over mass media. It, does he lie all the time? Well, then I think you got him dead to rights on that. But certainly uh, that there is some real danger ahead. I don't know how intimate an examination there really has to be in order to figure out that that's the case. All right. Let's see. Uh, What other stories might we be interested in cramming in here before the end of the show? Wow. Um, I think we, let's see, we can let that lie. I think there's been a lot of explainers in the last couple of days about exactly how it is that, well, the the whole thing is falling apart now. But you remember Trump trying to hold the Affordable Care Act um, premium subsidies hostage in his budget negotiations. And then finally Mick Mulvaney saying, we'll... uh, We'll offer up one or we'll free up and allow to go forward one dollar worth of premium support uh, for every one dollar Democrats agree to appropriate for the wall. That was a big subject of discussion over the weekend, flatly rejected by Democrats and for good reason. Uh, just a total misunderstanding of the whole hostage taking situation to begin with. In addition to which, why were we being asked to pay for the wall that Mexico was supposed to pay for? Big embarrassment for Trump, really. By today, actually by last night, it had become obvious that, uh, he wasn't really going to press this issue. After all, he was backing off of it. And it, the administration, if it didn't get its way this time, might wait for September in the next budget go round for asking for funding for the wall that Mexico was going to pay with, which pay for, which they eventually will, as Trump tweets again this morning. Everybody's kind of laughing in his face about that one. Uh, he got some very favorable headlines. The uh, I guess the take on it was that Trump was showing flexibility. 
by allowing the uh, by by saying that he wouldn't necessarily get in the way of a uh, a solution to keep the government open and operating after the end of this week over the wall funding that he might seek it in September after all that's a cave in for anybody else but flexibility when it comes to this guy I guess I don't know why they would give him the benefit of that doubt but so far that's what they're doing let's see um there's a million different things that we really have to cram in here uh and I'm going to do it this way one quick hit on this story from USA Today, we'll stick with the headline and the first couple paragraphs to get the idea out there. Trump condos worth $250 million pose potential conflict. Want this story on the record because I think this will become an issue uh, in the next coming couple of days. And uh, you'll want to be able to say, oh, yeah, I remember I heard about that on the K-Girl in the Morning show. Dateline Las Vegas here, a piece from uh, Nick Penzenstatler. Steve Riley and John Kelly in USA Today. President Trump's companies own more than 400 condo units and home lots whose sale could steer millions of dollars to Trump, a USA Today investigation has found. Just another one of the businesses he hasn't disposed of and still holds on to while president. USA Today spent four months cataloging every property Trump's companies own across the country. Wow. Reporters found that Trump's companies are sitting on at least $250 million worth of individual properties in the U.S. alone. Property records show Trump's trust and his companies own at least 422 luxury condos and penthouses. From New York City to Las Vegas, 12 mansion lots on bluffs overlooking his golf course on the Pacific Ocean, and dozens more of smaller pieces of real estate. The properties range in value from about $200,000 to $35 million each. Now, unlike developments where Trump licenses his name to a separate developer for a flat fee, profits from selling individual properties directly owned by his companies ultimately enrich him personally. Now, Trump has never disclosed a complete unit-by-unit inventory of his company's real estate holdings or sales, nor is he required to do so by federal law. Trump says he's separated himself from his businesses, but the trust he set up in January is run by his sons. Trump is the only beneficiary, and by the way, a story we didn't get to discuss explicitly a few weeks ago, can, under the terms that he set up, which is ridiculous, withdraw funds from it at any time. So this is how he separated himself from his business. His sons run it, and he can revoke that and take back control. And in the meantime, he can pay himself from the fund any amount, anytime he wants. Total separation. So there's the basic issue. And there's another piece to this puzzle, which is that the USA Today guys who are tracking this have noticed an inordinate number of the most recent sales of these properties, these unsold condos and and penthouses and lots, have been, when they are concluded, sold to limited liability corporations, which, of course, do not have to reveal the names of their owners. Since launching his White House bid, the story says, Trump's companies have sold at least 58 units nationwide for about $90 million. Almost half of those were sold to LLCs. In other words, it's a big, as it says up here, a big black box, a system failing as a check for conflicts of interest. That, according to Heather Lowe, Director of Government Affairs at Global Financial Integrity, a D.C.-based group aimed at curbing illicit financial transactions. Basically, now that he's president and when it became clear that he, I guess, well, either was at least the candidate, I guess nobody really thought he was going to win right up until the end, But now that he's the president, you can form an LLC, hide your identity, and buy millions of dollars worth of properties from the Trump organization and enrich the president directly and personally. Tell him you did it. You say, hey, I'm the owner of whatever else. I I suppose you could just lie. I don't know why I'm not doing that. Hey, Donald Trump, I am the owner of, I should look it up, which LLCs have bought these things. I'll tell him I'm the owner. And I guess he can find out 
but only, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly how he can find out. I guess the president can worm that out of anybody. But that's the basic deal. His friends, his supporters, Russia, anybody can basically form an LLC, hide their identity, and just funnel straight up, funnel cash directly to the president. It's exactly the the kind of emolument and corruption that this whole system was designed to avoid, but it's just out there. It's just laid bare. That's just too bad because there's no system for enforcing it because nobody's ever had the guts to just flout the law that badly before and we don't know what to do about it. So I wanted to make sure that was on the record. And one other weirdo form of corruption that I feel like we got to put out there before it explodes without our having noted it. Uh, this all came at about the same time that the Trump inaugural committee finally filed with the FEC on its incoming donations. As you'll recall from our discussions earlier, there is, of course, no requirement for any reporting at all on the expenditures made by an inaugural committee. It's entirely up to them. So uh, taking into account that Trump's tiny inaugural, like his tiny hands, there was hardly anybody there, as you all saw, and hardly any big, splashy events. It's, to be sure, there were some, and that certainly cost some money. And yet, they raised about twice the amount of money that Obama's inauguration did, and his was a, Obama's was at a much larger scale. So there's much, much more money and much, much less being done with it, What's going to happen to it? Trump, of course, says, oh, it'll all be donated to charity. I just can't tell you when or where, but uh, we'll get around to it, no doubt. But, you know, as we noted, there's no requirement that that be disclosed. And there's also no regulation of how it can be spent. So maybe mm, President Trump gets a $100 million appearance fee, for instance. Could be anything. But uh, there's more controversy surrounding the inauguration fund than just that. And here's a great example of one type of corruption. This in Mike.com, as we're finding more and more interesting things uh, over there. This, uh, let's see, Trump inauguration donor's son was involved in NSC meetings on Venezuela, exposed, I guess, for the first time by Mike. This being written up by Anna Schwartz, or Swartz, no, it's just S-W-A-R-T-Z, published on the 21st of this month, on January 19th, just the day before President Donald Trump's inauguration, a businessman named R.W. Habush, whoop, 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 red light, siren, Habush, what kind of name do you think that is? Would R.W. Habush get in and out of the country during Trump's Muslim ban with no difficulty? Well, probably not flying on commercial airlines, probably coming in general aviation, so maybe he's just fine. He gave two donations to Trump's inauguration committee. One donation came in at $166,000. The second at $500,000, a whopping, uh, a whopping total of 666, just happened to be the case, $666,000. Now, that's alarming all by itself, 666. But hey, that's not the issue. Two and a half weeks later, as detailed in an exclusive Mike report, Habush's son, Wadi, Yes, Wadi Habush, no worries whatsoever among Trump supporters there, found himself in a pair of high-level meetings at the White House. Not just a visitation, though, by the way. Wadi Habush met with the National Security Council and Trump's chief of staff, or rather chief strategist, sorry, Steve Bannon. The subject at hand, why did Steve Bannon even allow that to happen? I don't know. Subject at hand, not terrorism, but how to open up business with Venezuela which is heavily sanctioned by the United States. The senior Habush's donations to Trump's inauguration committee were first reported by Rachel Maddow on a Thursday episode of her MSNBC show. Maddow pointed out that according to the FEC filings, Trump raised $107 million, a record sum, for his inauguration festivities. What were the donors donating to? Maddow asked, what were they expecting to get for their money? Well, a couple of weeks ago, when a reporter named Jake Horowitz posted a story at Mike.com about at least one thing that appears to have come out of that money, Maddow said, she went on to cite the meetings between Wadi Habush and the National Security Council officials reported by Mike. In a normal administration, the National Security Council doesn't get used for stuff like this, Maddow said. 
The National Security Council officials do not have to meet with half million dollar donors to hear their ideas on sanctions on some other country. Now, Wadi Habush, who along with his father R.W., they run the Habush Group, you'll never guess, an energy investment and consulting firm. And they met on February 8th and 9th with top White House officials, including Bannon. And they also, uh, there, by the way, a, another top businessman named Gentry Beach, who arranged the meetings with the aim of lifting U.S. sanctions on Venezuela, which could pave the way for opportunities in the country for U.S. businesses. Beach has close ties to Trump's son, Don Jr. That the meeting took place at all, even before the revelations about R.W. Habush's donations, raised alarms among ethics lawyers and former officials on both sides of the aisle. If the account is true, it raises serious questions about the conduct of foreign policy by the Trump administration. Mark Firestein, who served on the National Security Council during Obama administration, told Mike in early April, those meetings should never have taken place at any level, let alone with senior officials in the West Wing. Venezuela's state-run oil company, as Maddo noted on Thursday, donated a half a million dollars of its own to Trump's inauguration, highlighting how a country in political turmoil may be spending money it doesn't have to potentially curry favor with Trump. But let's take a look again at the totality of the situation here. Venezuela, how are Trump supporters and ultra-conservatives with the idea of Venezuela these days? Uh, Hugo Chavez no longer, of course, on the scene. But, uh, I mean, are they suddenly happy with the Venezuela, the government of Venezuela? Uh, and it is, of course, in turmoil. How interesting that they would decide now is the time to lift the sanctions so that uh, oil men could make a fortune in continuing deals with them or starting new deals with them. Uh, and how interesting that it would go to, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just strange that the Habush family, which would ordinarily, you think, have difficulty even traveling in and out of the United States, even though they may be citizens... Born in this country, what have you, I don't know what their background is, but it seems sort of odd that they would be invited in to sit with the National Security Council on the subject of Venezuela, where they just happen to have, you know, a potential million dollar deal going, or a billion dollar deal more likely, uh, to get a hold of their oil, which uh, for the most part, as I recall, Tea Party types and Trump supporter types were supposedly boycotting way back when Sitco was cooperating with the Obama administration. And giving away free home heating oil in a propaganda move, keeping old people in the Northeast alive. And those are blue states anyway, so screw them. This is a really serious thing here. Now you give million or half a million dollars to an unaccountable inauguration committee, which doesn't need the money at all because nothing was going on. And you're meeting with the National Security Council. They're selling meetings of the NSC at this point and all aimed at reducing sanctions put in place that through no, you know, obviously for no good reason are preventing Trump supporters from making millions and millions of dollars. We got to do something about this. What an odd situation. Another one of those strange corruption situations just happened to accumulate around the feet of Donald Trump. No one knows why. Anyway, it's time to hand the microphones over to Wink and Justice for the after show. Here's what's coming up on today's episode. Six Flint, Michigan residents arrested at the water crisis town hall meeting for not removing their hats. A Republican North Carolina judge resigned to circumvent efforts to strip power from the Democratic governor. Yay. And the Russians who hacked the Clinton campaign also have targeted French presidential candidate from Emmanuel Radio, Macron. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Who could have predicted that the Russian hackers would start hacking uh, the uh, electoral opponent of Marine Le Pen? What a surprise. Anyway, they've got all of that in place on the last half. Another visit, as usual, with Chris Reeves, a.k.a. Tom Servo 433, to discuss the dynamics of campaigns, nuts and bolts, dynamic scoring, and the dynamic spectacle. Next.